No matter what else is happening in the world. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news, no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Jim Dearman, your host for Good News Today. Thanks so much for joining us for another edition of our program. As always, let me tell you what's coming your way on today's program. Of course, our devotional time begins every program. That consists of our scripture reading, beautiful singing, and then a brief study of our scripture. Today, our scripture comes from John's second epistle, the one chapter second uh, epistle of John. And we're going to look at the first four verses of second John. So second John verses one through four. Get your Bibles if you don't have them already and be ready to read along and study along with us. Let me tell you what else is coming your way. Another Cody's Corner segment as he uh, has another one of those excellent object lessons for us that you will not want to miss. And then Freddie Clayton comes your way with walking and talking through Proverbs today as he talks about Proverbs 24, 23 through 26. And then we have another GNT Q&A. Our question today, what did Jesus mean by the phrase, the keys to the kingdom? Keys to the kingdom. What did Jesus mean by that? We'll go to Matthew 16, 18, 19 and come over to Acts 2 to answer that question as always from the Word of God and the Word of God alone. Again, thanks for being with us and we hope you're ready to read along with us from 2 John verses 1 through 4. The elder to the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoiced greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we receive commandment from the Father. We are back for the study portion of our devotional time, and we're looking today at the first four verses of 2 John. And um, in the verses we read, truth, of course, is a key word. In fact, truth is a key word in this uh, one chapter epistle, and it's, um, it's a key word in the third epistle of John. In fact, the word truth appears five times here in 2 John, and in 3 John it appears six times, and there's an emphasis on, on the truth. Now, as we begin our, our study briefly, what about this elect lady and her children? Well, there have been uh, all sorts of opinions as to the identity of the elect lady and her children. There have been those who see it as a figurative expression, the word lady, the elect lady, meaning the elect church, those of the church who are uh, elect, and so they see it in that uh, in that light. But the question has been asked in regard to that: If the lady is the church, then how do you identify her children? Wouldn't the church be also uh, children as well? So, uh, who are the children uh, here? So, it seems to uh, me and uh, to others as well that um, the elect lady was an individual, uh, faithful Christian woman here uh, whom John appreciated uh, so very, very much and uh, her family, her children that he had a, a personal acquaintance with. And it's a very tender, uh, tender greeting here to the elect lady and her children. Now, the word lady uh, in the original language of the New Testament is, uh, well, we would transliterate it K-U-R-I-R, -R, Curia, but uh, in English it would be Syria, C-Y-R-I-A. And uh, it is thought that 
that being the case, that Syria would be a proper name. And I think that's likely uh, the case. Of course, that doesn't change the, the truthfulness, uh, the genuineness of the epistle as to the identity of the recipient. But um, the elect lady, it seems to me, would be this individual Christian woman. Perhaps her husband was not a believer or he had died because her husband is not mentioned uh, anywhere at all. But her children uh, are, of course. And um, John had obviously come into contact with uh, some of her children. We'll see that down uh, at verse 4 in just a moment. To the elect lady and her children, and then he expresses his love for them, whom I love in truth, whom I love in truth. That is, whom I love sincerely or truly is the idea here. If you go back to uh, 1 John 3, and verse 18, you have a similar type expression where John in that first epistle writes, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Let's love not in just word or tongue, but let's love in deed and in truth. In other words, let's love truly. Let's love sincerely. And that um, is the identical thought here, it seems. Whom I love sincerely, whom I truly love. And then he adds, and not, not only I, but all uh, also all those who have known the truth. This is an expression of a common love that Christians had for each other. But the common love that Christians had for each other, and therefore that Christians should have for each other even to this moment in time, is a love that is based upon a common acceptance of truth. In other words, the key to fellowship the key to communion with one another, and obviously the key to communion with God and Christ, is truth. Truth is absolutely essential. And he goes on to emphasize it in the latter part of verse 2, because of the truth which abides in us. Notice the truth that has settled into us, that remains in us. He doesn't, he doesn't talk about a, a, an indwelling of the Holy Spirit that does something for us apart from the truth, he talks about the truth that abides in us. It is the truth or the Word that abides in us that enables us to be pleasing to God. It enables us to come to God through Christ in the first place. We are to be born of water and the Spirit, that is born of water, baptism, according to the teaching of the Spirit. And how does that Spirit teach? Through the Word of God. And then that Word continues to guide us because we have it today in its complete and final form. And that Word as it abides in us guides us from earth to heaven. John expresses a confidence here. The truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. The truth is not going to go away. The truth is not going to change. The truth is unchangeable. Remember what Paul wrote to the Galatians when he spoke about the gospel and he said, I marvel that you so soon removed from him who called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is not a, another gospel, not another, but some are, some are troubling you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And then he added, but though we are an angel from heaven should preach any other gospel unto you than that which we preach to you, let him be accursed. There is no other gospel. It is sure. It is steadfast. It abides forever. And John was confident that that truth was going to abide with this good lady, this good Christian woman, and, uh, and those of her children whom he knew were walking in truth. Now here's an expression in verse 3. Grace, mercy, and peace. We see that expression many times throughout Scripture. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. This is a powerful statement as to what it tells us about truth and love being inseparable. You know, there are a great many people today who would say that love is the important thing, not law. And as long as we love, then law is not that important. But you can't separate love from law, because law is synonymous with truth. John 17, 17, Jesus prayed, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. That's how we're set apart for a holy use. That's how we remain set apart for a holy use is through the truth, through the gospel. And so grace, mercy, and peace 
come from God. Grace is the ground of our salvation. Without the grace of God, without, without that being present with God, His grace, His favor, He would never have sent His only begotten Son to provide the way for us to have salvation. It's been said then that mercy is God's grace in action. Mercy acts through God's love and grace in order to relieve the spiritual misery that characterizes man in his sin. And when he comes to a recognition of that, he's miserable. But God's mercy extended through the giving of His only begotten Son brings about that relief from that guilt, that deliverance from that misery when we obey the gospel of Christ. And thus peace is the result. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the word from is there twice from God the Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. It originated with God, His grace, acting through His mercy in the sending of His only begotten Son, but it's the Son who revealed the Father. What we know about the Father, the nature of the Father, we see through the Son. He revealed it to us, and of course inspired writers wrote it for us so that we see God through Jesus Christ, through that written word that abides in us. But notice the last few words of that statement, in truth and love. There's truth again, coupled with love. In truth and love. We're to love the truth. And we can't say love is separate from truth and that truth is not all that important as long as we have love. No, the two are inseparable. Now, John now in the final verse of our reading today, I rejoiced greatly, verse 4, that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we receive commandment from the Father. Apparently, from what John writes here, he had been able to have contact with some of this uh, Christian woman's children. And in making contact with them as they were away from home, he realized that they were remaining faithful to God. They were walking in truth. Now that's an expression that tells us that truth is something we are to walk in. In other words, we are to keep on obeying the truth. The, the word walking is used a lot in Scripture to describe the Christian existence. It's a walk. In other words, it's forward movement. It's onward movement. We must keep on walking. Walking in truth. So John had apparently come into contact with uh, some of her children. Now does that indicate that others of her children were not walking in truth? No, no, we're not told that at all. It's just that John had obviously come into contact with some of her children. He knew them to be faithful and he was glad to report his rejoicing over the fact that they were walking in truth as we receive commandment from the Father. What commandment from the Father? To walk in truth. Therefore all of us are commanded from the Father to walk in truth. And as John writes in his first epistle, 1 John 1, 7 through 9, that walk is in the light as He is in the light. And as we walk in the light of His Word, as God is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses, that is, keeps on cleansing us from our sin. Well, that's it for our devotional time. Time now for another excellent Cody's Corner segment with Cody Boston. Welcome to Cody's Corner. Today I would like to talk to you about candles. If you're anything like my wife, or if your wife is anything like my wife, then you have candles everywhere in your house. A every corner I turn, behind every picture or whatever there might be, there's always a candle I had no idea that we had. She loves candles. And when we clean the house, we'll light these candles so that it will make the house smell nice for a company to come over. Uh, and we recently had several from our congregation come for a fellowship meal. And, and so we were cleaning the house. We had several candles lit, and it was nice, and it smelled nice, and it looked nice. And we have candles for a lot of different reasons. And we light candles. We'll, we'll light them, but one interesting thing about candles is when we do light them, one candle is not really strong enough to light your entire house, is it? But you have to place candles throughout your house in different locations to provide light for the whole house in, in a case where maybe you lose your power. Also, when I think of candles, 
I, I think that people like to light them and sit there and they'll maybe read a book or, or work at their desk. And as that candle is lit, not only is it kind of providing a nice smell, but you almost can feel a little bit of warmth, can't you, from the flame. And so being next to that candle, being near that candle will provide you a little bit of warmth. Being a candle, spiritually speaking, shining the light of a candle in a spiritual sense is not dangerous necessarily. It's not wrong if, if our light that we shine as Christians is a candle. But there are some things we need to be aware of. As we think about Matthew 5 and verse 14 to be the light of the world, and we think about the different lights we shine and the light we want to strive to be, which is to be a lighthouse, if we find ourselves as candles... That's not necessarily a bad thing, but there's some growth that really needs to happen. As a candle, you shine a light, but it's not really a light that's strong enough for maybe your whole community. You shine a light that for maybe your closest group of friends, they, they see that light. Those that are around you all the time, they see that light. But it's not quite strong enough to provide light for a bigger, a larger group of people. You think also of a candle, those that are around you that see that light, they might even feel kind of warm when they're around you. They like how they feel when they're around you. So that means you're doing something right. But there's a danger as a candle to think that you're limited to only providing light for that small group of people. There's danger as a, can as a candle light to, to think that your responsibility is only to be light for this small group of people, to provide warmth for that small group of people. You're called to be so much more. I'm reminded of a story of a gentleman that was climbing the steps of a lighthouse to get to the top so that he could prepare it and light it for the, the ships out at sea to get safely to shore, to get where they need to go. And this gentleman was climbing these stairs, and in his hand, he had a candle. Now in this story... They converse back and forth, and as they're climbing the stairs, the candle asks, where are we going? And the man says, we're going to light the way for all of the great ships to be able to see where they're going. And, and the candle says, well, why are you taking me? My light is not strong enough to provide what those ships need. They, they can't use my little light to get where they need to go. I, I'm not a strong enough light. Why am I the one you're carrying? And the man says to the candle, you do your job. You shine your light, I'll take care of the rest. They get to the top of those steps. And at the top there was this big lamp with a loop behind it and the man walked over to it and had the candle in his hand and he used the flame from the candle to light the lamp of the lighthouse. And in a sense he took that candle and turned it into a lighthouse so that all the ships could see where they were going. You and I we might feel like we're candles. But what I want you to know is in the hands of God, He makes us so much more. We might feel like we can only shine our lights for a small group of people. But in the hands of God, He takes us and He carries us to the top of a lighthouse and He turns us into a lighthouse. He gives us the strength we need to shine our lights brighter for more people to see in our community, in the workplace, in, at school, at the, the, the store when we go to shop, wherever it may be, God enables us, He empowers us to be an extremely bright and powerful light. Don't just limit yourself and think that your light is not strong enough because in the hands of God, it definitely is. As you shine your light, if you find yourself being a candle, Allow God to take control of that. Allow yourself to be an instrument in the hands of God and watch what amazing and beautiful and wonderful things He can do with your light. Well, that's it from my corner of the world. I hope that you have a blessed day. And our thanks to Cody Boston for another excellent Cody's Corner segment. And coming up, it is Freddie Clayton with Walking and Talking Through Proverbs after we take a brief break. We'll be right back. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee 37327. 
That's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll-free at 1-877-384-7221. That's 1-877-384-7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our viewers is always good news to us. And we hope you'll take advantage of the contact information we've given you. We want you to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and we'd love to have you visit our website at gnttv.org and sign our guest book while you're there and let us know how you receive good news today. Right now, we're going to receive another fine message from Freddie Clayton, walking and talking through Proverbs. Let's consider Proverbs 24, 23 through 26. These things also belong to the wise. It is not good to show partiality in judgment. Who who says to the wicked, you are righteous, him the people will curse, nations will abhor him. But those who rebuke the wicked will have delight, and a good blessing will come upon them. He who gives a right answer kisses the lips. Judgment and justice should never be perverted. Showing partiality is one of the first things children pick up on, is it not? If you've not discovered that yet, then you may very well be on the receiving end of the partial treatment. We despise such attitudes and actions as much as the Lord does. Listen closely here. This applies in every area of our lives. I have said and will continue to say and stand ready to defend the position that crooked referees, umpires, and judges are an abomination to God. Notice an example the wise man gives in verse 24. He says to the wicked, you are righteous. That is not just missing it a little bit, folks. That is the very opposite of the truth. It reminds me of Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. Woe to them who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. If that does not accurately describe the attitude and intellectual ignorance of much of the world in which we live today, someone please help me see the difference. The sad consequences of this result in the perverting of justice and doing wrong under the false color of law and equity. A good judge will know the truth, not faces. To know faces is to allow a friend and help him out in a bad case or go so far as to leave out anything that can be said or done in favor of a righteous cause when it is the cause of an enemy. We must never connive for or encourage wicked people in their sinful attitudes and practices. Courts in their place and religious leaders in theirs are to deal truthfully and faithfully. That means that the wicked man, even though he may be famous, even though he may have a particular last name or a specific friend, must be convicted of his wickedness to show him what will be his end and expose him to the others so they may avoid him. But if those whose office it is to show people their transgressions, let them slide and plot for them, if they excuse the wicked man, or even worse, if they prefer him and associate with him, which is in effect to say, you are righteous, they shall be looked upon as enemies to that which is good, which is what they are supposed to be advancing. What will be the result of that? The community shall curse them and cry out shame on them, and even those of other nations shall abhor them as corrupt betrayers of their trust. They must always give judgment according to truth and fairness. They must give a right answer, that is, pass sentence according to law and the true merits of the case. And only then shall everyone kiss his lips. That does so. That is, they will love and honor him and be subject to his orders. Here mentioned is a kiss of allegiance, which is less commonly mentioned than the kiss of affection. The person who in, who in common conversation speaks appropriately and with sincerity, recommends himself 
and is beloved and respected by all. These are the people we need to be. Until the next time, let's keep on walking and talking through Proverbs. And coming up, it's our final segment. It's our GNT Q&A. And the question, what did Jesus mean by the phrase, keys to the kingdom? We'll get to that answer to that question from the Bible, as always, after another brief break. Back for our final segment, it's our G&T Q&A. The question we've already mentioned, what did Jesus mean by the phrase, keys to the kingdom? Well, he used that phrase in Matthew 16, uh, 18 and 19, after Peter had uh, made the good confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, Jesus responded, verse 18, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So I'll give you, and of course the other apostles uh, were included, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Well, what is the kingdom of heaven? Well, clearly in the New Testament it is revealed to be the church. The church and the kingdom are one and the same. And in fact, in this statement Jesus said, I will build my church and I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He used church and kingdom of heaven interchangeably. So clearly the church is the kingdom. Well, all we have to do then is to see when the church came into existence. And of course, we read that in Acts chapter 2. And that was the day of Pentecost following the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. Remember the apostles asked Jesus in Acts 1, uh, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Acts 1 and verse 6. And Jesus said, it's not for you to know times or seasons, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me, etc. Well, in Acts 2, 1 through 4, we see exactly when that power came upon them, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. They, the apostles, were all accord, in one accord, in one place. And there came a sound from heaven, tongues appeared, and they began to speak with other languages they had not learned. And they preached the gospel for the first time, the gospel synonymous with the keys to the kingdom. And the kingdom, the church, came into existence when some 3,000 souls heard and obeyed the gospel, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized. Thanks for being with us. Always good news, good news, good news, there's good news today.